Welcome to Time to Talk Science and Medicine, a new podcast designed to highlight translational researchers from Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. The main goal of these podcasts will be to focus on the researcher, find out where they've come from, what motivates them, and how their research will change the world. We're also trying to find out a little bit about the person behind the dangerous idea, which makes their research world class. My name's Dr. Charlie Highmarch, and I'm a genomics researcher at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. And my name is Dr. Stephen Archer, and I'm a cardiologist and the scientific director of the Translational Institute of Medicine here at Queen's, which is called TIME. Today, we're joined by Dr. Amajori, who is a clinician who is an expert on 3D echocardiography, a full professor at Queen's University, and has CIHR-funded laboratory that investigates carotid arterial plaque assessment by ultrasound. Dr. Jory is also the founder and former editor-in-chief of the Point of Care Ultrasound, or POCUS, journal. So, uh, Dr. Jory, thank you for coming on to our show today. Uh, as Charlie mentioned, you're both a doctor and a scientist. Can you tell us your origin story? What got you started down this crazy path to being a clinician scientist? Thank you, Stephen and Charlie. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I'm very humbled to be asked these questions and given some time to uh, find out and share some of my uh, background. So uh, as you mentioned, I'm a clinician scientist here at Queen's University, and I'm a cardiologist. And um, my origin story, I think, is quite multifaceted. I would say that <clears throat> there were uh, moments at which I wasn't sure whether I would be in the caring professions. I think that had always attracted, was attractive to me as I was growing up um, and uh, being in a profession where I could make a difference and um, care for people. I think that was part of who um, I felt I was and that was sort of instilled um, from an early age uh, by my, my family. Um, the issue was that uh, I wasn't really familiar with the road to medicine. And I know that there might be people listening that uh, may have uh, similar uncertainties. And uh, this, this related to the fact that there, there weren't any professionals in my family with a healthcare background. And I, I felt like I, I was really pioneering uh, my path uh, towards this uh, profession uh, at a at a uh, early age, and specifically during uh, university, I went to McMaster, where I initially elected to study uh, biochemistry, and at that point, I realized that there were a lot of people. Uh, wishing to become uh, physicians or nurses or physiotherapists. And I did feel intimidated and I did feel uh, concerned about whether I'd be able to reach uh, the, uh, the profession. Uh, and at one point, I actually switched into business. Uh, but then I realized my heart wasn't there and I switched back um, and kept trying. And uh, eventually I was able to get into medical school um, and really realize that this is where my heart was. And uh, I've you know, really uh, not regretted being a physician uh, since day one. Another very important aspect of my personality and why I'm here today is related to the fact that I think I have an artistic personality. So I'm someone who really enjoys um, painting, for example. I've enjoyed photography in the past. And so I'm a very visual person. And research allowed, for, allowed me to explore that creativity. It's a very different path than a clinician. Every day is very different. And you have to come up with creative solutions to uh, problems that are completely unforeseen. There's no protocol. So that aspect, that avenue for creativity, I think is what attracted me to research and to innovation and um, exploring science in my profession as a physician. Well, we're glad you uh, chose medicine, not business. So Thank that's, you. That's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. that's good. I, I think it's I think it's fascinating the fact that uh, the, the the kind of the 
the, the professional area that you have it is essentially imaging is essentially mm -hmm. kind of looking at the, the the mysteries of inside the body and being able to visualize it so that you can make appropriate diagnosis so you think that the creativity led you towards uh, echocardiography rather than another discipline yeah i i would agree with that so i i am someone who is very good with their hands so at one point i had considered a surgical uh specialty as well uh but for me, particularly um, looking at the image of a heart, um, how could I create a better image of the heart to see inside a person better and understand their pathology or understand uh, their disease course? Um, the, that uh, that's why I think I was attracted to the imaging background of um, specialties. I think I think I think the life story is is one of the things that's falling out of these podcasts is that the life story. Uh, I think the public and 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 generally uh, and students especially imagine that kind of these pillars of society, the cardiologists, the professors, uh, it was a straightforward course to get there. But in actual mm -hmm. fact, the barriers that you have to overcome and the challenges, and some of them are self-imposed, like, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting to sort of see that coming out. I have to say, interrupt you and yeah. say thank you for calling us pillars of society. We, we rarely <laughs> hear that in the world of cardiology, but it will take that as a promotion if unearned. Uh, uh, absolutely. absolutely. They're, they're, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, so... I'm glad that you overcame these barriers to success, and obviously now you're 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 a practicing clinician, uh, but also that you run a research laboratory and have kind of extensive interest. So it's probably a good idea to ask what your dangerous idea is. Then you know what are you trying to tackle right now? Okay, that's a great question. I think I had a dangerous idea nine years ago. It was so dangerous, everyone just ignored it, kind of thing. So um, I really feel that. Um, our group here and the work from our laboratory really helped coin the term point of care ultrasound or POCUS and um, show its utility across different professions. So, so maybe just to tell the audience what, what, what you mean is. by sure. yeah, points, yeah. Of, points of care so, ultrasound. So uh, conventionally, ultrasound is usually handled by specialists. What we've been promoting is the use of ultrasound at the bedside by the treating physician to answer a question immediately. And so that's a different way of uh, thinking. Um, and for our, for our audience that might not be familiar with ultrasound, it's usually conducted by large machines that are rolled into a room or the patient is moved to a uh, different laboratory where that test can be done. But what's really cool is that with miniaturization and some advancement of technology, ultrasound devices can fit into um, handheld sized devices. It's sort of like the, um, the Star Trek tricorder type of idea where you have this little uh, gadget that you're right there with the patient in front of you and you're getting all this information uh, from, from the patient. So about um, 10, 10, 12 years ago, I really saw the value of this and there was some pushback because there were specialists who felt that this type of technology should remain in the hands of uh, specialists, so in the in the hands of echocardiographers or radiologists. And so, in fact, my work was actually uh, looked down upon a little bit. I remember being at a conference, having a poster up on point-of-care ultrasound um, and feeling like no one's coming by to see my poster, whereas everyone else is getting the attention um, and asking, you know, why are you doing research in this area? Uh, but I, I really felt that it was an interesting um, way of democratizing uh, ultrasound and imaging, bringing it to the hands of other other individuals. And I, I imagine that's especially important in kind of like remote communities uh, outside of the urban sprawl, <clears throat> being able to yeah, have, uh, yeah. these tools in the hands of local clinicians. Exactly. And, and we really... Um, focused in on that and have some very old publications uh, talking about the, the value of bringing imaging access to remote and, and geographically remote uh, regions. Um, and, uh, you know, I really felt that uh, when you look at the, the stethoscope, uh, which hasn't changed in over 200 years, it's basically a 
tube that's used as a listening device, um, it w- there was time for um, advancement of auscultation, which is the listening or assessment of the heart during physical examination. So we were very early on looking at point of care ultrasound devices to get a look at the heart, to look inside a person's body and paint a better picture of uh, what that person's pathology uh, looked like. Uh, And subsequently, what's happened is I think uh, there have been some bigger names than me that uh, have, have come out with papers that say, oh, you know, uh, POCUS is the new new stethoscope. Uh, but here at Queen's, we were trying to deliver that message uh, much before that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, 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 uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's not about, um, you know, uh, necessarily being the first, but um, being part of that community and seeing how it grew and developed over time. So we're really proud of the work we've done. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to accomplish was to create the world's first uh, POCUS journal, um, a journal dedicated to this uh, application. And that's because we we recognized its value very early on. And so we, that's why we were um, uh, sort of early adopters in that regard. You know, listening to you, Amar, it reminds me a little bit of the Gutenberg Press because the idea back in the day was that you'd have a book, it would be in the church, and you'd come and listen and we'd read it to you. And I think there were the same antibodies probably around point of care ultrasound. We, as a, someone myself who read echocardiograms, we believed in the high quality control of having a central lab in which these reports are generated. And that still goes on to this day. But there is, a, as you say, this democratization of the process where the individual doctor could take the device out into the field mm-hmm. and make his or her own determination of cardiac structure or lung structure. And I remember the early days when you were setting up the Focus Journal, and it's come a long way. I mean, you took it from nothing to a major force and uh, were, the, I believe, the inaugural editor of that journal, correct? Yeah. So I was the inaugural editor, and I was the fa- sort of the founder of the journal. And um, our first editorial board uh, were our, my friends at Kingston Health Sciences Center. So people like um, uh, Rob Tenzola and Joey, uh, and Joey uh, Newbigging uh, were sort of the, the initial people that helped develop this and peer review the, the journal. But now it's really grown above and beyond uh, Queens. So the, the bigger audience now is in the U.S., um, I have a separate editor in chief uh, to make sure that there's that separation between the publisher and the peer reviewer, and uh, our review board is now global. That's great. Well, congratulations. I'm going to take you to the next level now. So you've <clears throat> you've been interested in ultrasound for many years and a practitioner of the craft. So what's your latest discovery in this area? What have you come up with recently that uh, we'd be interested in? Thanks for that question. So I, I think, um, as you know, in research, a lot of the times it's very incremental and it's not necessarily, you know, um, you look under a Petri dish and you discover a new enzyme. I know that happens in your in your lab. Mm-hmm. Uh, with my work, which is more bedside patient-oriented research, it's a lot more uh, incremental. And so it's about showing the value of a new imaging technique or a new test to uh, helping patients uh, at the bedside. And so what we've discovered, and I would say it's a, it's been a, a, a slow buildup leading to the, the finding that carotid ultrasound, so that's ultrasound of the main artery in your neck, um, acts like a very important uh, gas gauge, or what we say barometer of uh, disease elsewhere in the patient. So it's a very good way to predict um, heart attacks and stroke in patients. And why is that important? Because we want to know which patients are at risk so that we can treat them earlier and better to avoid them having a heart attack and a stroke in the first place. So that's what um, this tool is doing. Um, And what we've done in our program is in fact shown the the value of it in correlation with 
outcomes. So how it relates to uh, which patients have heart attacks and uh, stroke. And uh, we were one of the first uh, groups to look at plaque within the carotid artery and not only look at its presence, but quantify it. So we were one of the first groups to develop 3D quantification of carotid plaque and show that the amount of plaque can predict the severity of disease in patients. That's interesting. And I remember when you were writing your CIHR grant on this topic that there's a lot of pushback because people will say, well, we have stress tests, we have angiograms. Mm -hmm. If you want to know if someone's going to have a heart attack, surely we already have 10 ways to do this. And for those that are not anatomy-oriented, the carotid arteries are superficial right under the skin in your neck. Um, so how do, you, how do you answer the critics who say, surely, Dr. Jory, we have ways of figuring out if you're going to have a heart attack without having mm -hmm. to image the neck? Yeah, exactly. So that's a very good point that you're able to access the carotid artery in almost any patient because it's a superficial vessel. So even in heavy patients where other imaging modalities might be limited, such as stress echo, uh, because it might be hard to see the heart in a larger patient, or even with nuclear imaging, there might be interference in a, in a larger, heavier patient. The imaging of the uh, carotid artery uh, is almost always successful, no matter the size of the patient. The other thing is that it's just an inexpensive test. When we think about our other tests that that are, are needed, um, they certainly have more glamour. They're considered sexier. They're they're pricier. There's a there's sort of a medical industrial complex that that is kind of supporting supporting them. And ultrasound is a very old technology. It's a safe technology, um, but that's what I like about it. And there is advancement in ultrasound. It's today's ultrasound is not the ultrasound that we used five or ten years ago. And so I'm trying to bring that excitement back to uh, a technology that just because it's cheaper doesn't mean it's not as good as something that's more expensive. Uh, so that's why I'm very passionate about using sound, which is what ultrasound is, to understand anatomy and understand uh, pathology and use its power to predict which patients uh, may be at risk of events in the future. So let me ask you to tease that out a little bit more because I think one of the things your technique sort of reminds me is that atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries, cholesterol deposits in the blood vessel wall, it's a systemic problem. So if it's yeah. in your carotids, it may well be in your heart. But are you trying to just diagnose that there are narrowings in coronary arteries or are you trying to predict the patients who are at risk of having acute cardiac events like a heart attack? Yes, so it's about trying to predict which patients are um, about to have a heart attack or a stroke. So what's happened now, um, there's been a paradigm shift in how we approach cardiovascular disease. And we, we just had a paper accepted to the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which is one of the major journals in cardiovascular. Um, and we're really now asking the profession to not ignore silent atherosclerosis or what we call subclinical atherosclerosis. We're asking people to change their way of thinking um, and look at atherosclerosis as similar to diabetes. So before there is damage from diabetes, we're monitoring patients' blood sugars. In the same way, before there's a heart attack or a stroke, we need to be monitoring a patient's development of atherosclerosis, even though it's silent and they're not having symptoms. So that's the paradigm shift that we're asking of the field to stop ignoring the silent component of atherosclerosis uh, because we do have a method of seeing it and that's using ultrasound. And because it's safe and inexpensive, it's a great screening tool that can be widely uh, applied. 
But just before we turn it back to Dr. Heinmarch, I guess basically what you're saying is that when you can see atherosclerosis in the carotid arteries, it's no longer primary prevention. It's almost secondary prevention. And you can begin to apply, I presume, cholesterol-lowering strategies, blood pressure-lowering strategies, other interventions, rather than waiting for something bad to happen and then calling it secondary prevention. You can go in That's initially. Right. Yes. And so over the last um, year or two, I've had the opportunity to be part of a lot of expert groups globally, um, such as in, in Europe, South America, and the Middle East. And the thought is that the terms secondary and primary prevention are not good terms. And so there's this discussion of moving away f from those terms just for the same reason that you, that you say. If you see atherosclerosis, people are recognizing that that needs to be treated. And uh, so that's not really primary prevention, it's something in between. So uh, the, the, the new term that's uh, trending right now is the, the idea that cardiovascular disease is a spectrum and subclinical atherosclerosis is early that can be detected and should be uh, treated to prevent overt atherosclerosis. Interesting. Well, I mean, I've just witnessed a great conversation between two cardiologists and kind of some of it is within my wheelhouse and some of it isn't. So let me just take this back just for our audience who might also not be cardiologists and just say, if you were going to explain your research to your average high school student, what do you need them to know for them to understand what you do at work every day in your research career? Sure. That's a great question. So um what I would say is that um, I'm trying to help patients by preventing them from getting serious illness to begin with. And the serious illnesses that I'm mostly concerned about are heart attacks and stroke. And the reason why I'm concerned about that is because uh, all of you in the audience know someone or have a family member who has been affected by cardiovascular disease. I have no doubt of that. That's because uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of morbidity and mortality uh, where you're living now in Kingston, um, in our region, in Canada, and globally still. And so what we really, uh, what I really feel needs to be done is that we need to prevent uh, that disease from taking hold uh, to begin with. I feel that if I can do that, I can make the greatest difference to the greatest number of people uh, across society. And so that's why the focus for me is on prevention and uh, finding tools to come up with a way to predict who's gonna have disease so that I can treat them earlier and better. And those tools happen to be related to imaging tools because again, I'm a visual person and, and it's what I understand. So if I can see something, then I can identify it and then I can say, I need to treat this person. And uh, so that I think that's the, what drives my work, what drives um, my daily tasks and my overall vision for my program. And it's interesting, you know, in, in 2024, that's sort of a case of power to the people. When, when a woman is pregnant, she goes in and has an ultrasound. And the magic that happens when a, the woman or the family sees this baby for the first time is pretty intuitive. And they may not be embryologists, but mm -hmm. they get the point. And I find in my own point of care ultrasound use in the clinic, when you show someone their beating heart or a leaky valve, it, they immediately understand it in a way that a long conversation would not accomplish. So it is it is that very impactful. I think people have reached the level in society where they know enough yeah. to understand what we're doing when we show it to them. And that's beyond just your anecdotal experience. There have been uh, papers published showing that if a person sees plaque within their carotid artery, they are going to understand the mm -hmm. problem. They're gonna start taking their medications and they're gonna stick 
to their medications. That's what we call adherence and compliance. And it's also been shown that their doctors are going to do a better job of giving them the right medications and making sure they're on guideline recommended treatment. So uh, showing the, as you said, showing um, a condition does have that magical effect, as you, as you mentioned, and in the same way, it can uh, really hone in on the problem for both the physician and for the uh, patient. I should imagine it, it, it empowers patients to also advocate for themselves once they've seen that there's a problem and they've actually seen it with their eyes rather than having some abstract concept of a problem, but they feel fine. Mm -hmm. To actually see it allows them to then continue reaching out to their doctor and continue like pursuing a healthier lifestyle to be able to address. 100%, because at that point, atherosclerosis is silent, but it's not invisible, right? So we've visualized it now, and maybe they're not having symptoms, but we know it's there. And so we want to prevent them from getting symptoms uh, in, the, in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's the happy story. Now I'm going to ask you a story, a question that, that seems to happen in every person's life, which is the bump in the road where despite all this work and training and effort you put into your career, um, things weren't going well. Uh, and I'm just curious whether you've encountered one of those bump in the road moments where you thought success might elude you. So I, I mentioned that, um, I, actually, you had mentioned you might ask me this question. And, and as a researcher, we all have problems with um, bumps when we, we take this journey. Um, you know, when, when I have a grant rejected or a paper rejected, I, I actually go into mourning and I, I don't even realize that. So it, it does affect you. you. You kind of try to think that, uh, it's the next grant will come through. I'll do a better job of trying to sell my ideas and and get people on board. Uh, but you still it still hurts you because you're you you're passionate about your ideas and you want other people to be on board. Um, so those I think are typical for most researchers. But I wanted to bring up one issue that might be more personal for me and um, may not be something that others deal with. But uh, one of the best parts of my day is providing mentorship with my trainees or my students. So uh, looking back, I love that the best. That's the best part of my day when someone says, I want to talk to you. We sit down, we talk about uh, their project, their research, where they want to submit, what they want to do with their life. And uh, so a lot of my trainees and lab members have been with me since undergrad and then they do their graduate thesis, then they might do their master's, they might go to med school, they might do their MD uh, master's with me or PhD. And so I really see them uh, develop. And part of their development is to go past Kingston and leave Queens eventually. Maybe they'll come back or maybe they won't. And that's always been hard for me because I've seen them grow. They're kind of like my kids. And like any parent, people have to um, fly the nest at some point, right? And you, you want to encourage them and you want to support them. But I have always found that hard to see uh, people go. We try to, uh, you know, since the pandemic, uh, one of the silver linings is that um, I've still had people working with our lab from remotely uh, because uh, you know we, we've had a good opportunity and good relationship and um, I want I want to keep keep up those contacts. But that's part of the process, I think. Um, seeing people develop, it's sort of uh, with mixed feelings that you see people um, leave as well. And as a as a PI and a researcher that has many people coming and going, um, that can be uh, hard to deal with sometimes. Yeah. Well, just as someone who has <coughs> adult children of my own, if you want to keep contact, just, just pay for their cell phone. <laughs> sure. and, and they'll, That's they'll, true. they'll never go. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I, 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 I think that, that, that in academia generally, I, I think that what most, most people don't know is if you supervise a student, it's somewhere between three and five years, and, and you invest quite a lot of time and energy and spirit and hope into yeah. these young people, yeah. and then they fly the nest. And I, I don't think anybody has ever really said out loud that actually it has an emotional to 
recoil on the supervisor as well yep. because yeah. you put a lot into this product and then they go and leave and then yeah. they go out into the world and that's a very positive moment but it's also bittersweet it yes sounds- it is and it's it's a very it's a very unique to the researcher um uh relationship because uh, you, you, it's a very it's it is an intimate relationship with respect to working on an idea that is very um, personalized to that laboratory, right? And and so it's not like um, that project, it's not a classroom. It's it's a one-on-one relationship that's very deep and develops over time. So it's very different than a, a sort of a teacher classroom situation um, where you, you work with an individual, they might become, you know, your protege, you see them develop, um, but then, of course, you know things things have to change. Yeah. Okay. So, so throughout this conversation, you've obviously told us a lot of successes as well as well as mm. bumps in the road. The, the successes of establishing Pocus as being something that kind of uh, garnered attention from your colleagues to the extent you set up a, a, a journal. But of course, the, the 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 march of science never stops. What mm. what's next for your field? What's next for your research? And, and you know, how are you going to tackle the you know the future problems? You know, what, what comes next? So, uh, you know, I, I believe in our ideas and we want to continue to develop them further in the same direction. But what we're doing now, we're really well positioned to bring some of these ideas together. And so we today, for example, we had talked about point of care ultrasound. And specifically, we were talking about looking at the heart uh, using point of care ultrasound. And then with Dr. Archer... I was describing ultrasound of the neck and looking for plaque in the carotid artery, which is different than the heart. What we're doing now is sort of marrying these two uh, pillars in in our lab, and we're looking at carotid point of care ultrasound, so point of care ultrasound of the neck. And the reason why we're doing this is because, as I mentioned, I think doing ultrasound of the neck is a very good predictive tool uh, for prevention. And who does prevention? Who does primary prevention? It's our primary care physicians. So the next step for me, and it's going to be a challenge, uh, is to bring point of care ultrasound specifically carotid point of care ultrasound into primary care offices. I really am passionate about that. I think that's where we'll have the the greatest um, uh, impact. And fortunately here in Kingston, I've had the opportunity to work with Dr. Sean Haffey, who is with the Queen's Family Health Unit. Um, And he's done some preliminary work and really um, taken off with, with this. So it's a wonderful collaborator. Um, and he wants to share this with his other colleagues at Queen's Family Health in, in the next little while. And we were able to show success with him implementing this. Just today, I was speaking to uh, Liana Mantella, who's a family doctor in Toronto, and she wants to bring that into her clinic. Um, and so what we're trying to do is spread this across uh, different um, family doctors' offices uh, in Ontario and, and Canada and look at its value in terms of a um, sort of a systematic study and show it, show its value. So I, I think um, it, it's, it is a challenge though, because as you know, family medicine is in a little bit of a crisis right That's now. Right, yeah. So they, they, they're overwhelmed. They have a lot of patients, they have a lot of paperwork. Uh, and we're really um, sensitive to that. You're trying to add one more test. We're trying that. to add one yeah. more test, but at the same time, we're trying to show the need to pay attention to primary care. At the same time, we're trying to bring resources to primary care. And at the same time, we're trying to build excitement around primary care. And especially the young graduates, they love point of care ultrasound, the medical students, they really want to get their hands on devices. They're sort of, you know, um, grew up using devices and technology. Uh, And and so we we want to bring that excitement to the practice of primary care uh, on a daily basis where this can be a tool that they use for practice. 
um, to improve the care of the patients, um, avoid complexity of their patients, and uh, maybe even uh, hopefully one day uh, figure out how um, we can increase billing f- uh, using these procedures for, for, for primary care physicians. I guess, I guess that uh, the, the, the younger that you are, the less disruptive a technology is because exactly. you don't have that kind of the, the baggage of having done an entire career using a particular technique. That's right, yeah. Although our, <clears throat> our mutual colleague, Dr. Tony Sanfilippo, who's a cardiologist, has been instrumental in Ontario in trying to bring quality control to regular old-fashioned echocardiography. Yeah. And it turns out in the province of Ontario, there's an awful lot of echocardiography being done, some very scrupulous, scrupulously and some mm-hmm. with low standards. And that's conventional echocardiography. Yeah. And one wonders, like, there's no question the genie's out of the bottle when it comes to POCUS, but uh, just before we get to some fun questions, are, do you have any thoughts about the regulation and quality control? Oh, yes, for sure. So, you know, I'm an echocardiographer uh, who has promoted, promoted point-of-care ultrasound. But um, if you look at uh, some of my previous publications, I always start by defining what point-of-care ultrasound is and what an echocardiogram is. And they both are different and they both have uh, value. Uh, so we really need to distinguish a high quality echocardiogram that is driven by guidelines. It's a, a full protocol and uh, usually done by a sonographer. And that quality needs to be maintained um, and that that will always be there. And I, pr- I want to protect um, quality in echocardiography uh, by distinguishing it from point of care ultrasound. Uh, and, w- w- and defining it as, as something that's a more of a accessible, uh, ubiquitous tool, but doesn't replace the echocardiogram. So that care has been taken, and uh, it's very much in line with um, what Dr. Sam Filippo's values are. In fact, um, he was the one that uh, suggested I start looking at point of care ultrasound 10, 12 years ago uh, to see what's going on with these devices. Um, and as you mentioned, the cat's out of the bag or it's a tidal wave and all we can do is sort of ride that wave and make sure that we're leading in terms of quality. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jory, for coming in to speak with us about all your research. And it's certainly amazing and I'm very proud of all you've accomplished. But before we wrap this podcast up, I'd be remiss if we didn't ask you a few fun questions sure. to get to know you as a human being. So I'll start off and then we'll go to Dr. Heinmarch. But uh, maybe if you could tell me what your favorite meal is and can you cook it yourself? Okay, so it's a great question. Um I really enjoy making crepes. So I uh, I have, and crepes are very, very versatile. They can be savory, they can be sweet. Um, it's, it's something that um, brings the family to the table. And it's usually, uh, you know, if, if there's a, a group occasion or a group fun event, uh, you need someone to do the breakfast. So that's always my job. I make nice crepes. Even when we go camping or something, I'll bring my my ingredients for for crepes. Well, yeah. a fun fact about this podcast is that both Charlie and I accept crepes. <laughs> okay, as I will, I will no, make no, you. No, no, no. Hang on, I've got, to, I've got to clarify because, yeah. of course, you know, using crepes in savory dishes is one thing, but yeah. you know, I, I have a sweet tooth, especially. Okay, you know, awesome. Pancakes. Yes. What's what's your ideal topping? Because I do actually favor the simplicity of lemon and sugar myself. Oh, okay, that's amazing. Actually, recently I've been, you know, it's 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 about what sort of has been sort of trending in your life and recently I've I've really enjoyed peanut butter and jelly on a crepe Ew. lightly <laughs> lightly put with a bit of chia seeds. <laughs> Obviously, no, not being North American, yeah. the idea of mixing peanut butter and uh, jelly. You have to try together, it. No, it's all wrong. You have to try it. Yes. I know I'll be in the mind. You you'll probably that. okay okay with Nutella though. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip to music and ask what kind of music that you like. And can you sing it or can you play an instrument at all? No and no. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm really into uh, uh, EDM and because you don't have to sing it. And so... Is that electronic dance music? That's right, oh, yes. Do I yeah. get a star? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I, I just find it, uh, you know, I, I enjoy working out and I like having a fast beat and uh, 
Also, I find that um, helps me type fast when I'm reading my uh, echocardiograms and getting through the day. So. No, I, I completely hear you there. I, I, I also share I need high an energy interest with that yeah. kind of music. So, do you do you play it on a good hi-fi? Because a lot of people who are into that kind of music also like the hi-fi and like the way it sounds. So you get on that road. Um, yeah, I, uh, it, it depends on, uh, you know, like, uh, when I'm in the echo lab, I just have my, um, personalized, um, Your AirPods, AirPods in. So yeah, to not disrupt and uh, not everyone's into EDM. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you, so another question, when you, when you're not doing science or medicine or making crepes, what would we find you doing? What, what are your hobbies? So I have really loved uh, gardening uh, recently. Uh, well, actually, I would say the last five, 10 years I've really gotten into um, gardening and planting and um, growing trees. Um, I've uh, Last year, I planted uh, 12 Newport plums and um, really getting into types of perennial grasses and landscaping, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. So you got a good garden then? Uh, I go there. I also order stuff online. Oh, yeah. yeah, all over the place. So, you know, an ideal vacation for me would be just to be able to just work on my garden and. I'll give you my home so. address. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, mine up. afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so last question, and it's one of my favorite questions, is um, which cartoon character do you think represents you the best? Oh my goodness! All right, which cartoon character? Yeah. Oh, that's a hard question. It is a hard question. It's yeah. probably the hardest you'll have all week. Okay. Um, which cartoon character represents me the best? Yeah. Or maybe your favorite. My favorite? <laughs> I, I just get... <laughs> you, you have to be honest. You have to be. <laughs> it's one of the ground rules of the podcast. I, I actually think uh, we should start, like, you know, we should do some groundwork and we should <laughs> nominate people for just in case for that's this right. question. Honesty yeah. is the best policy, which means dishonesty is the second best policy. <laughs> well, the thing is, you know I can't lie because we already talked about this. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I can tell you, I recently watched um, a... Um, animated movie called Arcane. Okay. And uh, it's based on a, a computer game, but you don't have to have watched the computer game. And I just found, I think it was uh, produced by a French uh, cartoon company. I would recommend anyone in the audience to watch Arcane. Um, the The artistry was, was amazing. The storyline um, and I, I really enjoyed that uh, that series. Yeah. On behalf of Dr. Archer and myself, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Jory, for taking time to get to know us today in the studio. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to get to know more about Queen's University translational medicine researchers or share this podcast, you can search for Time to Talk Science and Medicine wherever you normally look for your podcasts. Thank you very much. 